Okay, friends. Uh, you know, it is the 48th week since we have started our journey in, of conducting this mega webinar series named as the Saturday Manufacturing Talks. So we are very much fortunate to have the different speakers across the globe from academia, from industry, sharing their expertise, knowledge, and views on different aspects of manufacturing. Now, we are standing in the era of Industry 4.0. As we can understand that it is uh, full of sensors, devices, computers, and electronics. So the packaging of the electronic components, starting from the semiconductor devices to the mainframe system, the manufacturing is a real challenge. So today we are fortunate to have Professor Anandru Bhattacharya with us. Professor Bhattacharya is the Associate Professor in Mechanical Engineering of IIT Kharagpur. You all know that. His research interest is in the area of electronic packaging and thermal management, transport in porous media and microfluidics. Anandru is Anandru has received his BTEC from IIT Kharagpur in 1997 in Mechanical Engineering and MS and PhD, degree, PhD degrees from University of Colorado at Boulder. In 1999 and 2001, prior to joining IIT Kharagpur in 2015, he spent 12 years in the industry working in various positions as researchers, technology leaderships, in Intel, General Motors, and GE Global Research. He has 26 patent file filings. Out of that, 17 are the US and 19 Indian patents. Two book chapters and over 60 publications in journals and, and conferences. He has received several awards in his career so far, including INE Young Engineer Award, Faculty Excellence Award from IIT Kharagpur, Fulbright Nehru IEAS Fellowship, Sastri Indo Canadian Institute SMP Fellowship, GE Organizational Citizen Award, and Inter Intel MPG Achievement Award. He is also the associate editor of the IEEE Transactions of Components, Packaging, and Manufacturing Technologies and ASME Journal of Thermal Sciences and Engineering Applications. I'm very much privileged and it is my real pleasure to introduce Anandaru because we are doing research in some fields of uh, in the common interest. With this, I, I'd like to request Anandaru to deliver his talk. Anandaru. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Paul, uh, for that very kind introduction. I'll start by expressing my thanks to IIT Kharagpur Center of Excellence in Advanced Manufacturing Technologies for giving me this opportunity to come and talk about electronic packaging, uh, which is, I still believe, does not get the due recognition that it deserves. The criticality and importance it has in the semiconductor electronics industry, uh, the contribution of packaging engineers and the packaging domain is often over, uh, often comes under the sh or falls under the shadows of VLSI designers, etc. So, uh, I would also like to congratulate the Center of Ad Excellence in Advanced Manufacturing uh, Technologies at IIT Kharagpur for this webinar series called Saturday Manufacturing Talks. It is not easy. Uh, it takes a lot of patience, effort, and perseverance to hold it continuously for 48 consecutive weeks, and I am privileged uh, to be part of this endeavor. So without further ado, let me start sharing my uh, presentation. I hope you will be able to see it. Um, can somebody please confirm that yeah. my presentation is visible? Yeah, 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 absolutely wonderful. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. So today I'm going to talk about one domain of electronic packaging and which is about what is called the first level interconnects or interconnections. Okay. Um, now, before I go into this topic, I'll just start with some notes which is already known to you, but probably just to set the stage. The electronics industry is probably 
one of the fastest growing industries, has been one of the fastest growing industries across the world for several decades now. Today it's growing at five to eight percent year on year. And to do that con continuously over so many years is indeed remarkable. Okay. And even within this, consumer electronics like our laptops, our cell phones, what we use every day, that growth rate is much higher. Okay. Uh, and this is because this technology, is, this whole field is so dynamic and fast moving that what is probably a blue sky idea today will turn into a commodity product within, within a year or year and a half. That is the life cycle. And then three years down the road, it is obsolete. Okay. So it's an ex extremely technology driven business. And please trust me, and this was also an eye opener. I wouldn't have known had I not worked in the industry that this is an extremely cost sensitive segment extremely aggressive, especially consumer electronics. We know that, I mean, today, something that costs, <coughs> maybe a cell phone that costs 15,000, one year down the road, the cost will be much lower because new products and new technologies have come and this is no longer that coveted anymore. And it is also have most of, especially consumer electronics have very limited life cycles. I don't think any of us keep our cell phones for more than two to three years. Laptops, maybe similar, maybe four years, okay? Compare that to, let us say other segment of electronics like automotive or aviation, where the product life cycles are much longer. So definitely, therefore, one size fits all. The kind of packaging that is required for consumer electronics will be different from that of avionics, will be different from that of defense, uh, oil and gas, etc. Okay. And electronics has really pervaded our, our daily life. I don't I don't think I need to <coughs> emphasize that any further, we all understand how dependent we have become on electronic gadgets and products. Okay. So the question is, what is electronic packaging now? To be honest, when I completed my bachelor's and before I started working on electronic packaging or taking a course on electronic packaging, I myself didn't know, I'll be very honest. So <laughs> does packaging mean about, you know, putting it in, in these carton boxes or cardboard boxes so that they can be shipped safely? Uh, well, that is packaging, but not electronic packaging as it is known or defined. So definitely not this. So it is important, by the way, I need to ship a product safely from place A to place B, but this is not electronic packaging. Therefore, what is electronic packaging? I just use this picture. On the left-hand side is something that we use every day, probably all of us are holding it now at this point. I have it next to me, okay? Inside that, you see the number of systems, devices, and subsystems, okay? So how do I take all of these and integrate so that each of these components and devices, sub-devices, function as per their specification, smoothlessly, seamlessly interact with each other, and gives the user, the end user, the user experience that is expected. Okay. So that is electronic packaging. So if I have to define, I'm saying that it is a service and art of providing a suitable environment to the electronic product as a whole to perform reliably over a period of time. Okay. Please mark some of my words. words. I have used the word art. And please, uh, and please make sure that our, why I have, it is, it is not at all uh, a word that I've used in passing. Aesthetics today become, has become very, very important, right? And we would be lying if we say that we don't want a good looking laptop or a cell phone. Aesthetics does become important. So therefore, how to fit it within something which is nice to look at, which is aesthetic, which is ergonomic, it's very important. The other thing, I would like to say is it enables it to perform and perform reliably, which means if I look into it, electronic packaging has two major functions. It doesn't add to functionality, okay? The CPU, graphics, memory, that will function as per its architecture, as per its architecture, okay? The VLSI design. But, how do I make sure that the CPU talks to the graphics, talks to the memory, talks to the wireless, talks to my voltage regulator, etc., seamlessly, and so that everything works in unison? 
Okay, so that communication between the different systems, different devices is very important. And the second part is the protection. Protection against environment, protection against dust, protection against moisture, protection against overheating, so that that word perform reliably. It has to perform today as a new product. It has to perform with minimal degradation three years down the road or during its entire expected life cycle. Okay. So reliability is also a very, very big part of electronic packaging. Okay. I was just giving this example uh, to Professor Paul and I give that to other my students as well. That you think of think about our human body. If I give you the brain, if I give you the heart, the, the stomach, the liver, the intestine, uh, the bones the muscles, uh, does that make a human being? So these are the, okay, these are the, these are the functional parts, no doubt, but how do I bring it together so that the human, uh, 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 we as human beings, it's a perfect, we, we, we function as a perfect machine, the brain, the digestive system, the nervous system, the circulatory system, they are absolutely working as a well-oiled machinery. So that's, that's the way God made us. And so putting all these systems together, that is similar to in, in case of an electronic product, that's the similar uh, you know, function of a packaging engineer for the packaging engineering team, okay? Why is it important? Again, the same picture, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, look at all the components. If you open up your laptop, by the way, please don't do it unless, unless it's out of warranty, okay? <laughs> but you can try it. Please, if you open it up, you will see all these things. Okay, you will see a circuit board, you will see a memory card, you will see fans, you will see heat sinks, heat pipes, batteries, etc., etc. And then you put everything together. So the connection between the device and the PCB and the system and the signal and power distribution between different components. Okay, protection, thermal management. How do I ensure that these devices do not overheat, do not get fried per se? Okay. And last but not the least, the cost. Cost is king. At low cost or at affordable cost. If you don't have the price point, the product will not sell. Okay, correct. How do you find place of everything for everything and ensure that everything works reliably and at an affordable cost? This is the role of a packaging engineer. Okay. So if you think about it, this is a picture I've taken from the book by Ra Professor Rao Tumala of Georgia Tech. And you see that how many different domains come into it. I'm not even getting into VLSI design. The wiring, the interconnections and wiring inside the motherboard and the way the connections from the, from the device to the motherboard. It's an electrical engineering problem. It's a mechanical engineering problem. It's a manufacturing engineering problem. Reliability, thermal management, materials. Okay, what are the kinds of materials of the motherboard? What is the kind of material of my, what I'm going to talk, talk about today about my chip carrier? What are the encapsulants? Okay, what about my thermal interface material? And later on, we will see even solder. I will just mention it now. Traditionally, solder is a very important part of any electric, electronic product. But as some of you know, that with, with this ROHS Act, Reserve, uh, Reduction of Hazardous Systems Act in 2006, from 1st July 2006 or 1st January 2006, I've forgotten, the lead tin eutectic solder is, no, is banned in any electronic product. So the whole industry had to move from lead, leaded solder to lead-free solder. And that is a tremendous shift, okay? Materials engineers played, are still playing a very, very important role. And so does manufacturing, which is the reason I'm here today as part of this webinar series, okay? So with that introductory, uh, with those introductory uh, comments about what is packaging and its importance, let me get into what are the diff how do I break up packaging into different levels, okay? The first thing is the semiconductor device comes from silicon, okay? It's made of silicon, we know, or some semiconductor, mostly silicon. Now we are talking about gallium nitride, uh, for power electronics, but still it's primarily silicon across the board. The starting point is something called a wafer. Wafer, you see a schematic there which looks like a tennis racket or badminton racket, but it's a circular disc made of silicon. 
on which the IC, the circuitry is printed or imprinted, integrated using several wafer level techniques like lithography and so on. We are not going to talk about that because that is under VLSI. And then this wafer with the circuitry is diced to give these small chips, which may be one centimeter by one centimeter. Okay. This wafer is 12 inch, 8 inch, 12 inch. These are the standard dimensions. From there, we cut out a lot of these chips. Okay. So this part, this manufacturing of the wafer is often called the zero level packaging. And the next level, when the chip with the circuitry is now put on something called a substrate and finally it's called a chip carrier, that is level one packaging. My talk, my presentation today will primarily focus on level one packaging, but I'm also going to talk about, talk a little, maybe one or two slides on the level zero. How is this wafer made? Because this is where we are talking about a well-known process called Chokralsky or Soralsky process. It's more than a century old. It was discovered by Jan Chokralsky in 1916. But how do we use it for making silicon wafers? There's a molten silicon with appropriate amount of dopant impurity atoms, which is there in a heated crucible. And the crucible contains this molten silicon and it rotates. And then there's a seed crystal that comes from the top, touches the molten silicon in the crucible. And the seed crystal is at the end of a stick, which is rotated and is moved up. So what happens is around the seed crystal, this molten crystal accumulates and finally it grows in the form of an ingot. So it's finally a large cylindrical ingot. Oops, sorry, why is my, okay. You look into this, look at this. It's almost two meters long wafer, two meters long ingot. About 12 inches in diameter, one foot in diameter. So this is a single crystal silicon that comes out. This is now going to be sliced into these thin wafers, which um, can range anywhere between from 400 to six, 600 microns today. And then on that wafer, the schematic of which we saw is where the IC or the integrated circuits are integrated or, or, or printed. Okay. So that part we are not going to talk about. And now let us say I have the chip from the wafer with the circuits of the VLSI inside. And the next step is level one packaging, which is chip on the chip carrier. Okay. So this is the silicon die on the left. And then finally, what you saw, see on the right is what is called the chip carrier. Is the first level or sometimes it's also called the, it's, it's, it's more often called the package. I'm showing you two types of packages, the upper one, is something like, uh, I mean, these are the same configuration. I won't say it's, a, it's, it's like a memory, but memory chips look like this. You probably have seen, maybe slightly different, but that's how it looks. It's actually called a dual inline package and I'm gonna talk about that. So what do we see? It has a silicon inside, which with probably very uh, large scale integrated circuitry inside. But then what comes out, are these two rows of how many? Seven, seven connectors on both sides. This is what we see. Now, how do I go from that silicon with circuitry to this package? And a more advanced one is what you see. This is, this is a desktop or a laptop CPU processor. Of course, you cannot see the processor. You see what is known as integrated heat spreader, which has this Intel logo on that. But on the, on the reverse side, you see those connectors coming out in the form of an array. Okay, so these are two types. One is called dual inline, the other is called an area array package. I'm gonna talk about those. What are the different types of area array packages and so on. So this is what is first level packaging. The chip goes on the chip carrier that has interconnects and which in, these interconnections or in IOs are going to help us, are, are, are going to get you know, attached to, to a circuit board on which there will be other components as well. And then this is how they're going to be connected with each other. And there will be transfer of signals. Okay. So if I look at, so let us take the top package first, which is a simpler construction. 
take a cross section and this is how it will look like more or less okay there are variations many different designs exist today but they this is sort of a parent structure you have the silicon chip as you see over here can i have the pointer yeah you have the silicon chip which which sits on something called a lead frame and you have to attach it using some kind of a bonding compound which ideally should have a decent thermal conductivity when i say decent thermal conductivity i'm still talking about single digit watt per meter kelvin okay then this whole chip is placed in a casing or a housing which can be made of ceramic or which can also be encapsulated plastic i'm going to talk about that and then what comes out are these leads leading to pins okay so this is what these pins or leads that are coming out which which we are calling the ios or interconnects is the communication of the chip with the outside world okay now the chip has its own connection points connection pads on top of it so the way so those have to connect to the leads and the way it is done is by a process called wire bonding so you have this bond wires okay so this is the cross section if you again go back if i take a cross section of the top package this is the parent structure that we are going to see okay so how do i make this so i'm going to first talk about a ceramic package where this cover or the casing is made of a ceramic material let's let's call uh, let's take the example of alumina so the starting point is the lead frame it is made of aluminum looks something like this and then you see an alumina alumina base base at the bottom then the die or the chip with the circuitry comes and sits on the lead frame and as i said there is a bonding compound by which it is attached the next step is the wire bonding so from the connection pads on the die the connections to the leads will be made by this wire bonding process then we put the ceramic lead on top and seal it around with a sealing glass and of course we we chop off the bottom part so that now all these leads are independent and not connected to each other so these leads that you see or the pins in the finished package is what is going to get into your motherboard there may be corresponding holes plated holes in the motherboard and there are some other configurations as well okay so this is a ceramic package assembly process we also have the plastic package which is where it is largely similar except that instead of you know a base and the lead what happens is after the wire bonding there is an encapsulant there is a molding process where there is a plastic encapsulant come, that comes on top and rest so therefore what happens is your entire chip the wire bond uh, the lead that that is inside the package they are all you know uh, encapsulated in this plastic molding compound okay and finally this is what comes out this is what we see uh, as a plastic package okay so ceramic and plastic similar in many ways but also different in the sense that this is a molding process now when do we use it of course we all know that ceramic package is going to be more expensive so ceramic what are the advantages over plastic is the fact that of course it is sturdy it is expensive it is it has better mechanical properties but most importantly it gives you hermetic sealing look moisture is one of the biggest enemies of any electronic connections so either the leads or the especially these bond wires inside and you cannot stop moisture ingress okay ceramic will have less moisture ingress plastic will have more moisture ingress so does it mean i will use ceramic no ceramic comes at a cost so therefore where i can accommodate plastic i will use plastic so therefore i don't use ceramic packages for consumer electronics but if you are talking about avionics if you are talking about defense if you are talking about space if you are talking about underground the electronics used for underground drilling or deep sea drilling uh, where it where it operates in a hot and harsh environments yes we will use, we use ceramic okay or where the life span is expected to be much longer like 20 years 30 years for example in an aircraft 
So this is ceramic versus plastic package. Both are equally important. Some have better properties, but it comes at a price, price in the sense actual dollars. So I will take this opportunity to just show you, I don't know if you can see it, I'll take, bring it closer. And you see some of these plastic encapsulated packages on a very small circuit card that I have. Okay, I'll show it again later. Now, one thing, all the time I was showing this leads leading to pins. And as I said that, how will the connection be made on the circuit card? By what is called a through hole arrangement where you have plated holes in the circuit board. And as you can see, there are wiring traces. So there will be some kind of a bonding, maybe by soldering process between the plated, between these holes, which has, which are plated in the inner surface and then the leads. Okay, and that is how the connections are going to be made. But there are other configurations as well. It doesn't have to be a pin. These leads can be bent in the form of an S where it is called gulving type leads, or it can be, you know, bent in the form of a hockey stick inverse, which is called a J type lead. Okay. Now, what is the main difference between the first and the gulving and between pin in hole versus gulving and J? The next two are called surface mount technologies. These do not require a through hole to be drilled in the circuit board. So what is the advantage? The advantage is now I can have, I can use the reverse side of the board as well for mounting, uh, for mounting uh, more components. For example, this is a single sided circuit board. I don't have anything on the opposite side. But most of your systems, if you open, especially cell phones, laptops, etc., you will see components on both sides. So these actually gulving J-type allow for surface mount technology. These are surface mount technologies allow for double-sided motherboard. Okay. The other thing is what is the difference between gulving and J? Again, it depends from product to product. J-type, the package will be taller because you know this bent is going inwards. Whereas gulving type will be flatter, but more area. It occurs more surface area on the motherboard, right? So again, it depends. If you in products where real estate, the the footprint is more important, height not so much. J type is good. In products where thin products is more important, and you you can afford to give a little more surface area for this package, gulving is good. Okay. So this is about interconnects. All this while I was talking about wire bonding, right? Now in, so the, the connection pads on the silicon is connected uh, or is connected to these interconnections that is coming out through wire bonding. So let us spend a few minutes on what is wire bonding. So wire bonding is an elect, as the name suggests, is an electrical interconnection technique using a thin wire. And what is the process? Okay. And what is the prime mover of those processes? There are two basic wire bonding processes, very similar. One is called ball bonding, another is called wedge bonding. Okay. And the process, these are methods, and the process is thermocompression, ultrasonic, and thermosonic. As the name suggests, it means that you need temperature, ultrasonic energy, and pressure, a combination of these. For the bonding to happen because this is pretty much a solid state welding process where there's interdiffusion of atoms. Okay. So as a, this table shows uh, when, when to use what or what conditions are required, let me tell you that the wire typically is made of aluminum or gold, okay, primarily. And the pads, the interconnection pads can be aluminum, can be gold as well for more, or gold plated for more expensive or more high-end products. So this is the ball bonding process where we have, you know, what, what you have is a capillary through which this wire is fed. So what happens is, firstly, this wire comes and through some arcing process, this ball is formed at the tip. Then the ball connects on the first connection point, And then the wire is taken up, taken to the second point, again pressed and pulled off. 
okay, through a clamp as is shown over here. So these are fine gold wires that are used and uh, typically ball bonding has a pitch of greater than 100 microns. Okay, so how does it look? So these were schematics. So take a look at this. This is the ball bonding tool and that's the capillary. You see how it is, how this wire is being fed. These are some pictures of some of the bonds and then a package, uh, you know, where, where of course it is not, it has not been covered with the ceramic lid or, or encapsulated in the plastic molding compound. But you see the finished bonds over here. I also have a small video which I would like to play. Sorry. For uh, people to see. Probably the sound will not work, but I will give the commentary here. So this is an automated bonding machine. And you will see the speed at which it can, it can do. This is a bit in slow motion, which is being shown. So we saw that uh, and how, how it is done. There are two things I would like to mention over there. First thing which probably you could not hear the commentary is that it said that there are 276 wire bonds and it takes less than 30 seconds. Okay, so these wire bonding machines can actually do bonding at a rate I mean, anywhere between 3 to 10 bonds per second. It is that fast. Okay, and secondly the other point I would like to make is which I'm not going to cover today but Probably Professor Bailey will cover it in next lecture. In that device, you saw two, two such chips next to each other on the same substrate. So that is called a multi-chip module. See a chip carrier, what we are talking about is one chip carrier and one, one uh, device or one die. There can be the same chip carrier or substrate can have multiple dies also, so which are called multi-chip modules. And that's what you will see. Uh, probably Professor Bailey will talk about it next week. And you saw uh, that picture <coughs> in that video, a multi-chip with two chips next to each other. Okay. So that is ball bonding. The next one is wedge bonding. It is, in a way it is similar, except that there's a wedge tool, you know, which has a hole and the wire is fed at about, at a certain angle, like 30 to 60 degrees. The process that is used here is either, so sonic energy is used, ultrasonic energy is used. It's either ultrasonic completely or ultrasonic uh, with an elevated temperature, especially for gold wires, okay, which is called thermosonic bonding. Okay, so the difference over here is the fact that the shape of the bond, as you see over here, because of the tearing process at the end, is different compared to like the ball type configuration we saw in ball bonding. Okay, so these are the two processes ball bonding process, wedge bonding process, and then depending on the material. The, the prime drivers or the way the bonding, uh, what should I say, the process can be ultrasonic, thermosonic or thermocompression. Thermocompression is only temperature and pressure. No, uh, no vibration set of either the substrate or the wiring or the wedge. Okay, so that's about wire bonding. Now this wire bonding, 
creates a problem in the sense, you know, first of all, these connections only, as we saw, are only happening around the edges. So if you look at the evolution at the beginning, the first one is called a single inline package. There is only one line of interconnections that come out. That was not enough. Of course, integration was happening. So more number of interconnections were required. So then we have dual inline package where you have two lines, two rows of these interconnections. Then there is something called small outline package, which is also similar to dual outline, except that, you know, these interconnections are more closely placed. And as you can see, it doesn't have this wide shoulder followed by the pin. These are all uniform thickness. So it allows for more number of interconnections for a given length. And then finally, something called a quad flat pack. So, so the point was, okay, we went from one side to two side. And then we said, okay, we have to use, we need more interconnection points. We need, we need to use the entire four sides. And that's what gave rise to what is called a quad flat pack. So now I'm going to show you again, this small daughter card. And what you see, this big one is actually a quad flat pack. You see interconnections on all four sides. And then the other smaller one over here is actually a small outline package. Okay. Maybe if you if you just pin on my screen instead of the shared screen, probably you would have you would be able to see bigger images. Okay. So the whole point, therefore, is that I am constrained by the periphery. And if I need to have more number of connection points, more number of interconnects, I need to make the package bigger. Okay. Because there is a certain minimum pitch between two successive interconnections that I need to maintain. So therefore, then the area efficiency is not, uh, I mean, reduces, right? So that is con continuously worrying the designers that what to do. I mean, I cannot keep on making the, I cannot have a like, you know, one centimeter by one centimeter silicon and then like two inch by two inch package. That's, that's not a good area efficient design. Okay. So the point was that can we have these instead of just, <coughs> you know, along the periphery, can we have multiple such rows of interconnections coming out, rows and columns on both sides? So that gives rise to what is called an area array package, which utilizes the entire bottom side instead of only the perimeter. Okay. And thereby giving rise to higher interconnect count. Now, how do I do this? So what are the different types of area array packages that are available? So I'm going to talk about three of them today. Uh, just one slide each. The first one is called pin grid array. Okay. Forget the die side, but what you see is the interconnects. If you see at the back side, see this array of pins that are coming out. This is called pin grid array. Extremely popular, used in many packages today, including our laptops. And uh, one of the, so interconnection pins between in the, in the, in, at the bottom, what happens is these pins go into some kind of a receptor, which is called a socket. The socket has corresponding holes. And that is how the connections are made. So again, I have a device here. Let me stop sharing my screen probably then. Uh, I'll come back again to sharing. So this is a package that I have, a PGA package or pin grid array package. Okay. So let me remove this and see the bottom. Do you see these pins? Okay. Inside this is a silicon die, so don't worry about that. Look at just the interconnection points. Okay. And then this on the test board, this is a test board, is the socket with corresponding holes. So what happens is these pins will fit exactly into the socket, okay? And then I push, push this lever in. So what happens is the pin goes into the socket and when I push the lever, it gets pushed towards one wall and the connection is made, okay? So this is a pin grid array. What is the advantage? Let me go back to sharing my screen again. How do I go back? Share. Yeah. 
You can see my screen now, right? Okay. So the advantage is I can take this package out and put it back, etc. The pins are delicate, no doubt. Uh, it has to be handled with care. But once it is inside the socket, it's pretty sturdy. Okay. By the way, these are all failed uh, test boards. That's why I was allowed to take them as souvenirs when I quit Intel, and which I now use it in my lectures. Okay. But however, as you saw here, that because of the socket and the pins, these have some height, so this package is thick. So the next part is called, next uh, configuration of array array package is called ball grid array. So here, instead of pins, we have an array of solder balls, okay, which then go and are soldered into corresponding solder pads on the <coughs> motherboard. So you see how the solder balls look. And again, here I have a BGA package. Uh, you probably won't be able to see. What you see here is this, this damaged silicon die at the top. Then this is my substrate, the chip carrier. And then the chip, probably if I go very close, you may be able to see the first row of solder balls between the substrate and the motherboard. Okay. But yeah, if you cannot see, you have to trust me. <laughs> okay. So. This is the area, and then there are inner balls like this, okay? So this allows, this has several advantages over PGA in the sense that these solder balls, of course, are much smaller. So smaller electrical paths, lesser impedance, okay, lesser inductance. Uh, definitely all those, and, and this is quite rugged, you know, there is no, unlike the pins which are delicate, which can get bent, broken, this is pretty rugged once it is assembled. But the drawback is this is a permanent attach. And trust me, I have faced this. I had a very thin, uh, just two years back, I had bought a like a 10 inch or 11 inch uh, laptop. And one fine day, like really few months into, into its uh, functioning, the display went off. Not few months, actually, it was out, so out of warranty. Okay. The display went off. I took it and I could see if I, if I could, if I attached it to an external display, it was working. So nothing wrong there. So I took it to someone, they said, yeah, actually that graphics interface, that card, something has come up. I said, okay, can it be repaired? And then they kept it for two days and they said, sir, no, I have to change the entire motherboard. And the cost of that is like 80% of the new product, of, of the product that I, of the price that I bought that laptop for. I said, why? Uh, he said, sir, because these are permanent, these are ball grid array attached. Because it is a thin system, it's not a PGA, it's a BGA, ball grid array. And I cannot remove ball grid array. Okay, I have to throw away entire thing. So that is the problem uh, with permanent attached thing is let us say there are many other such devices on this board. If one of them goes wrong, you have to just throw it away. Whereas here, if it's a removable one, you detect which one has gone bad, you remove that and replace it. So, you know, plus and minus, advantages and disadvantages. The third one is called land grid array. So land grid array, it's in a, lot of ways similar to PGA or pin grid array, except that the pins here are on the socket side, not on the package or substrate side. And the pins are like this S-shaped pins, pins which, which, has like a, which act like a spring load. And then there are pads. Instead of pins coming out from the bottom of the substrate, you have these pads. So what happens is when this substrate is placed on this socket, the pads and the pins and the lands actually, they align. There is a mechanical force applied from the top and which is as crude a mechanical attachment as you can see over here. This is actually actual product, okay. <laughs> and that is how the connection is made, okay. Now these pins, these lands are much thinner than the pins, so it allows for a much higher number of interconnections on the same area compared to PGA, okay. But of course, these are more expensive as well. So these three uh, are probably the most three more uh, most common type of area array packages used today, pin grid array, ball grid array, and land grid array. The other types of socket technologies is something called MPI, metallized particle interconnect. It's a soft material with metallized particles inside. And when you press, when you apply force, the metal, uh, there is a continuous electrical connection path that happens because these metal particles uh, form a continuous chain under a certain pressure. That's called MPI socket. Then there are various other, various other types of <coughs> designs that have been tried out in niche areas. But again, most prevalent are these three. Okay. Now we are still talking about wire bonding. 
So what next? And wire bonding again, again, we are, uh, you know, we are restricted by the interconnection points, typically on the periphery. So the point is, is it possible to directly bond instead of wire bonding from the top of the device die to the interconnections? Is it possible to directly bond the active surface on the substrate or the, or the, or the chip carrier? So that is called what is known today, very well known as flip chip technology. It's almost standard today. It was first introduced by IBM. So what happened is where they said, okay, instead of the circuit side facing upwards, I'll flip it and make it face downwards. And then attach it to the, to the substrate using what is called a solder, very similar to BGA, okay, using a soldering process. Okay, so therefore you see here, I'll, I'll show it in, uh, in, a, in a bigger blown up picture here. So in wire bond versus flip chip, see the connections instead of wire bonds, the connections are due by solder balls. Okay, and there's something called a epoxy underfill. It's an epoxy which is pushed into the gap so that it fills in the space between the solder balls and then it is cured and it becomes quite hard. Okay, so in a flip chip package in this configuration, you won't be able to see the solder balls. Okay, like the one I have here. You see, this is the silicon. This is sitting on the substrate, but I cannot see the solder balls because what I see here is this epoxy around. Okay. Now, what is the process? This is the flip chip process in a very cartoon from Wikipedia, very elementary. So this is, these are my connection points. Now I can put connection points on the active side of the die across the entire surface, not the, just the periphery. Then I will have solder balls by what is called a bumping process. Flip it over and bring it on the substrate, which has corresponding solder pads. Align them and go through what is called a solder reflow process. Whereby it's basically goes through a, in the reflow process, it is heated at a certain temperature and at a certain ramp rate and for a certain amount of time so that the solder just melts, forms the bond and then solidifies again. So this is the flip chip process. There are three primary <coughs> sub processor under it. One is called the bumping the die, attachment to the substrate and finally epoxy underfill. What is the bumping process? Bumping is when I put this, uh, the process of bringing the solder balls on the connection pads. So remember, most of these uh, connection pads on the silicon die is typically aluminum. Okay. So it will, with time, it will, it has wetting, it, it will get oxidized. It will have wetting problems. So therefore, first, what is done is there is something called an under bump metallization process. Okay. By which you give a small thin coating of maybe aluminum, nickel, or copper on the connection point. So that is UBM. Then you bring a photoresist material to expose only the portion where I need the solder bump to occur. And then the solder bump is deposited typically by electroplating process. Thereafter, the photoresist is removed and the excessive material that is hanging out of the solder part is also etched out. You know, the, the excessive metal that I had deposited during under bump metallization. Okay. And after that, it is reflowed. So as the solder is reflowed, the, the solder melts and due to minimization of surface energy, it takes this form of a ball or a bump. Okay. So this is the schematic of the bumping process and the sequential process. And this is how the solder bumps look like. Okay, before it is attached to the substrate. Okay. So the next process is now you take it, flip the chip and reflow the solder and use some solder flux. We know all that to remove the oxide, etc. Please note that the amount, the time for heating, the temperature, ramp rate is all very, very important and, and has to be optimized perfectly. If it is not enough, 
you are it's not and and the solder doesn't wet the bump you will not have a circuit connect connection so it's called a dry joint the connection is not made on the other hand if we do it excessively then the solder melts and it is possible that the two subsequent two adjacent solder balls connect with each other forming a short or a bridge so neither do we want a dry joint nor can we afford to have a bridge and once again if anything goes wrong you have to just throw it out because if one of the inner solder balls is damaged there is no way to know okay even if you know i mean you cannot do anything so it's very very important but this process is extremely you know it is more than 50 years old now uh, it has gone through a lot of advancements etc to reach the point where it is today extremely optimized and so this is the bumping and attachment to the substrate the final one is the underfill process so this is an epoxy that is dispensed along the edges and then it goes through primarily due to capillary action and fills in the entire you know spaces between between the solder balls and then it is heat cured to form a permanent bond now why is this underfill required it is very important because the silicon and the substrate which you see this green material typically fr4 have very different coefficients of thermal expansion so now when you power it on there will be differential thermal expansion leading to stresses on the solder joints which can lead to cracking right so this epoxy is chosen such that its cte or coefficient of thermal expansion lies somewhere in between these two and so that during this differential expansion process it can compensate for any thermal expansion difference it can also take up a lot of the stress except instead of entirely go that going into the thermomechanical stress going into the solder balls alone so that is its main function but in addition it also protects the bombs from moisture other environmental hazards and also provides its mechanical strength it is once cured it's like rock solid so again once again i will show this and you see that this is the epoxy between the silicon and the substrate but one thing to notice is just what i said is the attachment between the substrate and the motherboard is also through ball grid area and solder balls but we don't use an epoxy there because the materials are the same over there so there is no very very little differential thermal expansion between the substrate and the motherboard as compared to the silicon and the substrate okay so with that i will uh, i'm slowly coming to an end i yeah i'm almost coming to the end of the time as well <clears throat> these are some of the two cpu package architectures that are most common today and see i am a thermal engineer so i <laughs> i couldn't have done a presentation without showing at least one slide of related to thermal <laughs> okay the first one is called bare die attach um, and what you see here is there is a substrate there is a silicon which is attached by <clears throat> flip chip and then this is a ball grid array between the substrate and the motherboard so when powered on the silicon is going to produce heat and i can put the thermal solution which can be a heat sink which can be a heat pipe which can be a cold plate directly on the silicon using what is called a thermal interface material so this is what is used on thin packages like your laptops the architecture two is something so this is like a this is also called the bare die art attach and this is an example okay the second architecture is when there is an aluminium what is called the integrated heat spreader which can be copper or aluminium which is also sometimes called the lid lid uh, and uh, what happens is this integrated heat spreader is connected to the silicon by some kind of an again thermal interface material which typically is a solder or or an equivalent material okay and that is how it is sold so when intel or amd will sell it is sell it like this this is what they sell okay and so along with the first interface and the integrated heat spreader and then on top of that you put your heat thermal solution which as i said can be heat sink or cold plate if it's liquid cooling and so on. so these are the two different architectures that are used today okay and this is this i'm showing as bga so you see uh, solder balls at the bottom of the substrate but it can be pga or pin grid array or land grid array as well now what i discussed today are some of the more conventional or classical packaging designs which are very prevalent in existing products today but there is also a lot of research that goes on 
uh, on advanced packages. So Professor Chris Bailey, who is a very well known authority in this area and who will give this seminar next week, he will probably uh, cover some of these advanced packaging designs and techniques. Okay, multi chip module I talked about system on package. So the entire I, just on a single package, I can have everything okay, for cameras or small uh, devices. It is possible. That's what we are trying to do. Then there is there can be package stacked on each other, dies stacked on each other. This is called 3D packaging or sometimes 2.5D packaging. 2.5D is basically on the same substrate. You have sometimes two dies and sometimes one die. Then package on package. Instead of die on die, package on package, pop. And now we all know about flexible or wearable packaging. And that is also gaining popularity where the substrate materials have to be completely different. Okay. And in all these, what we will see is a lot of these fab level, the wafer level processes like lithography, etc., which is done in these clean rooms, that is actually now making its way into level one and level two packaging as well. By the way, level two I have not covered today. Level two is actually the motherboard part. Manufacturing of printed circuit boards, having the connection points and how the attachment of these different uh, packages on the motherboard, that is level two packaging. That, that itself is a big field in its, on its own. Okay. After that, the motherboard gets into a panel, panel gets into a chassis, chassis gets into a cabinet. All the steps may not be present in all, all products, but these are the subsequent levels of packaging. But level one, level two is common to almost all systems. Okay. I'll just end with a few research directions today. The first one I already talked about is from 2006 onwards, there was a complete shift away from the lead tin solder and which is today mostly replaced by the sack solder family, which is basically tin, silver, copper. Okay. SN for tin, AG for silver, and CU for copper. That's the sack that's come from. Okay. Now, what happens as a result? See, the entire process that was optimized for 50 years for leaded solder, those process parameters have to be completely changed. The mechanical properties are completely different. Okay. The entire, you know, the solder joint reliability, those studies have to be done afresh. So that many the, so the scientists have been working for close to two decades now on developing the more optimized solder materials. Carbon nanotubes, okay, graphene and then carbon nanotubes. These also have a lot of potential applications at multiple levels. On-chip and off-chip IOs. Of course, I, off-chip IOs, I talked about the interconnections, all these that we were talking about. What if you replace your pins and solder balls by these carbon nanotubes? You know they have excellent electrical properties, they have excellent thermal properties, and they have excellent structural properties, okay, in certain directions. And again, these properties can be tailored depending on the angle of rolling of the graphene sheet. And then thermal management. This can have very high in-plane thermal conductivity, and therefore you can replace your spreader by these graphene based materials okay and last but not the least and very relevant to this seminar series is about additive manufacturing and 3d printing you looked at the entire you know the entire stack right from right from the motherboard to the substrate to the pins um, the encapsulant etc now think about it can i print all this using 3d printing maybe not today but it is possible right and then I am not restricted to just periphery or in the form of an array or anything. I can have any kind of pitch. Okay. I don't have to rely on, you know, wet solder joint or so on, or, or a dry solder joint or so on. Okay. So fabrication of complex features at the micro nano level, that's possible. So right now we are not there yet, but 3D printing is being done for variety of components like sensors, antennas, EMI shields, passive devices, etc. I'm showing you a picture here of a cell phone cover, which is 3D printed with an integrated antenna and EMI shield. Okay. So again, another very important topic. Many people are working on it. So in summary, I would say electronic packaging, it's a very critical, I hope after this, you will realize the importance of this. I mean, uh, you finally won't have the product if electronic packaging engineers are not there. But yet it's often underrated domain. It's slowly getting importance, gaining its due recognition. Okay. Uh, 
then the it's a multidisciplinary field needing expertise across different i mean you talk about manufacturing thermal applied mechanics materials uh, semiconductor physics everything reliability okay how do i predict the life cycle how do i predict the degradation along the life cycle you need reliability models which can be stochastic models which can be physics of failure based models okay now first level packaging which i covered today you saw how how it has grown from very simple to very complex and that doesn't mean the simple designs don't exist today they do exist everything has its own place for low end products i don't need to have uh, very sophisticated packaging designs my single inline or dual inline package is good enough okay and as we saw advanced manufacturing techniques i'm not talking about just additive manufacturing these are all advanced manuf high tech manufacturing techniques that's at the core of any good electronic system okay so with that thank you very much i hope i have been able to give you a flavor i often get asked that oh, you are a mechanical engineer what are you doing at intel uh, beyond the point i stopped responding <laughs> but uh, i hope if any of you had that question probably uh, at the end of this talk you would at least appreciate the role of a mechanical engineer in the electronics industry thank you very much and uh, it was again a pleasure uh, and I, I will be happy to take any questions and answer to the best of my abilities. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anandarup. Uh, it's a wonderful, you know, the lecture, wonderful description. You mentioned that you are a thermal engineer. You don't have the manufacturing, that much of manufacturing flavor. And, but I, I don't agree with that. The way you have uh, described the critical manufacturing process involved in the level one of, you know, step. Uh, it's very lucid and it's very wonderful. You know, the, some questions are coming up uh, in our in my mind, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I definitely some questions would also be there. Uh, you know, from, from the audience, uh, you have rightly told the the electronic industry it's very fast changing, so the cost factor is the very critical one, and that's why the manufacturing steps have to be uh, rightly adopted. Now, when you talk about the uh, different, uh, you know, the configurations uh, in the wire bonding process, like the PGA, BGA, and LG, and other things, and all, you know, uh, the question is that how do you check the quality? Because if I don't check the quality in the real time, mm -hmm. and 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 it, uh, that would be completely wastage. Uh, you know, if I if I you know the fit it onto the motherboard and then finally the quality check is made. So is there any way presently, yes. because I'm finding a, a, you know, some sort of a research scope uh, that whether the real time quality check can be done for the wire bonding process. This is one question. Another one is that when you talk about the, you have mentioned about the packaging architecture, you know, different types of the architecture uh, you have mentioned. So, I mean, what are the what are the things you are uh, going to i mean what are the objectives like uh, is it only the thermal management is the consideration for the optimization of the different no, 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 no. or if not then what else okay okay the first question about quality check i think during the manufacturing process there is a quality check um, after every step so i know that i don't know exactly about wire bonding but yes they do mention the, they they do measure impedance across certain number of interconnects etc and 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 make sure that i'm not not an expert in that i have not worked in the but but i know that there is a process okay so quality check is done but definitely more can be uh, we can always improve the process and again i'm not very knowledgeable in the, in that area um yeah once it comes reliability becomes important and yes uh, we do we, there is definitely a lot of reliability testing that happens and and you know these boards that i saw are actually test boards test we called it test vehicles and we did a bunch of reliability studies on that how much um, you know what how does the electrical performance degrade how does the thermal performance degrade uh, under what is called it's called accelerated degradation modeling we we subject these packages to harsh environments at high temperature high humidity and and try to see that how it fails and therefore then try to interpolate it as to under normal operating conditions, what will happen. So the second question that you asked is about what is, how do you choose the architecture? First of all, where you are applying it and uh, what is the cost price point, et cetera, that plays a very important role. But just from the technical point of view, uh, 
thermal is not the only consideration in fact thermal engineers have always complained again that even within packaging they don't get the due recognition it's often it used to be over the wall design okay i've designed this now cool it now of course they are working together but what happens is that thermal is a consideration solder joint reliability structural failure is a consideration okay uh, especially or let us say you you of course you, you are you, you work in manufacturing there are these electronics in your machine tools which undergo a lot of shock and vibration during its operation it has to withstand that okay so the reliability con constraints are and the environments are completely different over there so that has to be i mean if any of these pins or balls become come loose and the connection is lost then it won't work and finally uh, and probably very important is the electrical part which i have not covered here so think about it that let us now i'll just give you an example of a project that i worked on while at intel without getting into too much of details we are talking about 3d stacking of dies so now in electrical engineer will and you know in a cpu die you will have the core region where you will have more dense architecture and then the rest will have something different now an electrical engineer will say oh we are stacking the dies you you align the cores on top of each other okay because then that is the shortest electrical path and and my performance electrical performance is going to be very high thermal engineer is going to say are you crazy you are lining lining up all the hot spots that is where the maximum heat is going to be generated and you are aligning them right on top of each other so that is going to be a disaster thermally so then the two will fight with each other and what we were trying to do was <coughs> we were trying to use a lot of this multi variant optimization techniques to find out that what is the final optimal design you have to define that function work function and what is the final optimal design which will be optimal both in terms of thermal and electrical this is an example okay similarly depending on the situation structural will also come in etc so definitely thermal when it comes to choice of architecture thermal is not the only configuration okay so i'm just only one of them yeah mm -hmm. yeah i have i, I have understood you know i'm just trying to explore the possibility of uh, the, the further research uh, you know your center of excellence and other uh, the organization can you give us some idea like uh, is there any indian manufacturer uh, uh, for this uh, the applications and all yeah there are i mean not at the level of the large uh, yeah that i understand not at the level etc but yes there are there are uh, small they call osacs there is a full form i'm forgetting that uh, there are some people in bangalore hyderabad and pune actually ieasa which is indian electronic and semiconductor association they work closely with these companies so there are there are some local players yes excellent uh, and when it comes to manu motherboard manufacturing yes there are quite a few i know i know uh, some in pune is there any uh, the, the you have mentioned about the uh, the sensor printing you know i know that the the work has also got started the sensors are printed through additive manufacturing routes onto the the substrate and all so uh, the uh, is there any work going on uh, in our country in that uh, in that aspect not that i know of but i may be wrong there as well i haven't heard okay yeah so anand some questions are there from the in the chat box uh, yeah yeah first one is uh, there is no such question it's a, it's a comment and all some you know information the second one is that how to ensure that in in bga the joint with the pads are done up to the mark yeah that's a quality uh, the yeah that's a quality check so there are points for example can i uh, come here yeah over there or even here for example these are all if you look at it at the back there are these in one place you have alphabets in the other place, other other direction you have numbers and then there are connection points at the back where you can measure the impedance between two connection points or even here for example this board has a connector at the at the end right it will go and then these connectors are such that i mean for test vehicles at least you can you can measure certain electrical properties or or resistances inductances etc yeah but so how to do that in real time like uh, the connecting the impedance or the uh, impedance for each and every point would be very real time i i am not sure uh, because it will be a mass production isn't it it will be a mass production so yeah 
so at the end i think it is uh, it is a separate uh, quality check not not real time so but there may be there may be advances again this this industry is very fast moving and i have not been in direct touch for since i left uh, industry so things may have moved on i which i may not know of. yeah so one question is also that the what technique is used to detect the whether uh, whether the weld is done or not so uh, again it's a quality uh, check question mm, quality check yeah. yeah sometimes there are some non destructive analysis techniques but you cannot use it for every product okay i'm mean, in the in the shop floor so piece of information is provided that the for mechanical testing offline destructive wire pull is the standard test for about 65 years of old if yeah if if, if uh, you know if the the others uh, do have any questions please quickly write in the chat box i saw something about ibm c4 some something flashed up was there a comment or what is it yeah it's just a common information like uh, yeah yeah it was so ibm when it came up it was called c4 control collapse chip connect so which is uh, what i should of course things have moved on a lot from there but yeah okay i think there is no more questions in the uh, in the chat box okay thank you anand roof we are uh, yeah it's close to 940 in fact it's cost 940 Thank you, Anudhu, for your nice uh, the the lecture. We all enjoy it, and we find that there is a lot of scopes are there for for our you know for manufacturing you know the guys to think about, in, especially in terms of the the quality check. Thank you for your presence. And uh, thank you. Yeah. And thank you very much. I saw Amrit also among the. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Uh, Amrit Ambi Rajan, and uh, yeah, I'm 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 very. privilege to be to have delivered this and uh, and we, next week will be professor chris bailey and probably he will take some of the more advanced uh, techniques yeah and i request you to be present uh, with sure uh, absolutely yeah so for the yeah as you mentioned the, the professor christopher bailey from the university of greenwich will be delivering the talk on the next week and the next to next would be uh, dr parth sarthi mandal from the university of manchester so dr mondo will be talking about the process modeling and its importance in the field of manufacturing and on the last uh, the week last saturday of the february professor sujit banerjee from the university of wadi wadi manufacturing group professor banerjee will be discussing on the development of the cloud computing with this we will be finishing the uh, the lectures of uh, in the month of uh, february and uh, as you know that we have already complete today we are com uh, completing 48 set at day since you know we started our journey so we are close to 52 weeks and after that we close this you know the session so if you have missed some uh, you know the past webinar you can also see it through uh, scanning this code thank you so much thank you everybody and i look forward to all of your presence in the next saturday till then goodbye